finish 90? Oh, you didn't think we got started. Well, let's go to Psalm 90 then. This is, uh, that's one that Moses wrote. Yes? We got to verse 11. I, I thought we got down somewhere in it. Yes, because we talked about the length of days. Verse 10. As for the days of our life, they contain 70 years, or if due to strength, 80 years. Yet their pride is but labor and sorrow, for soon it is gone and we fly away. Who's writing this? Moses is writing this. How old was Moses when the Lord took him up on Mount Pisgah? He was 120. So Moses, who is 120, is writing this psalm, and he's writing, I believe, by inspiration. The Holy Spirit's guiding him to write this down, and he writes down by the Holy Spirit's guidance that human life is three score and ten. And if by reason of strength, you get another ten. Yes. Well, Moses was how old when he left Egypt? He was 40. How old was he when the Lord called him at the burning bush? He was 80. So how long did he lead the children while they were in the wilderness? 40 years. It, it seems to me God's going to let you live as long as he needs your service or wants your service. I don't know that we, it's right to say that God needs anything. But he wanted Moses to live to be 120 to complete his service. And then when Moses died, Moses didn't die because he got old and sick. He went up on the mountain with the Lord. And, and, and it ends the way we want it to end. We want to close our eyes in sleep and open them in the presence of God. And Moses was already in the presence of God. And so it's just like there was a transition there of some kind. And by the way, who argued about the body of Moses? You remember reading about that? Satan over, argued over the body. Of, where's Moses buried? Yeah, that's, isn't that interesting that we really don't know anything about the burial of, of the patriarchs? Uh, very little, anyway, I, I guess I should say. But it's interesting, but, the, but it's God's reason. Yes. Exactly. As a matter of fact, I, I probably told you this. Uh, it's one of those stories, things you think about every now and then. You go, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. But when we were doing, going to school in Denver at the Bear Valley School of Biblical Studies, by the way, uh, Lord willing, uh, is when we begin our worship assembly, I'll be introducing you to a family we're now supporting to go to school at Bear Valley. We've supported uh, missionaries in foreign fields, but we decided let's, let's start supporting somebody who's going to school to, to do preaching work in the United States. And so uh, the Blankenships will be talking about them. We've got a relationship going with them. It'll probably last us at least two years. So uh, I'll be talking to you about them later. But how did I get off on that? Uh, now I don't remember how I got off on that. Uh, PJ. Yes. Yes. Anybody else? When, when you go back and you read about Enoch, what, what does the scripture say about Enoch? Okay, Enoch was with the Lord and then he was not. Why was he not? Because the Lord took him. Well, how did Enoch die? Well, did he die at all? He just made the transition. To me, it, it seems like it's a lot like when you walk through a door. You walk through the door on this side, you're in this room. You walk through the door on that side, you're in the next room or the hallway or wherever you're going. And with God, I, the word dimension, we don't come up with the word dimension in Scripture, but we think about that. Uh, we think in terms of how many dimensions. Three, normally, unless you're from the 70s and then you think about the fifth dimension, which was a... a <laughs> all right, that's a rock group from the 70s. But See, so we think three-dimensional, but we don't know what other dimensions of existence there might be. We don't even know everything that's in the physical world. I, I use the illustration of infrared light and ultraviolet light. When were they discovered? 
1800 and 1801, which is not very long ago. But how long have infrared light and ultraviolet light been around, do you think? Ever since the creation. We just couldn't see it. We just didn't know it. What about electricity? People knew there was something when lightning struck. They probably couldn't figure out what that was, but, but there is electricity. And now science is telling us our, our bodies run on a certain amount of electric impulse. It's just there's a lot of stuff we don't know in the physical world, and so it stands to reason the, the, the spiritual world will just be way out of our uh, realm of understanding to some degree, except for the fact that we're made in the image of God. Our humanity, our real humanity, which is what the Psalms speak to, is the, the actual reality of our existence, and it has nothing to do with our physicality. We're connected right now, but what happens when we die? We just laid Mary coffee to rest yesterday. That's how we say it. Why do we say it that way? We say it that way because all we have left is the body. Where's Mary? She left Tuesday morning. <laughs> she went to be with the Lord. We use that phraseology because it's absolutely true. She went to be with the Lord. Actually, the Lord came for her. That's what Luke chapter 16 says. Uh, God sent his angels to collect Lazarus. And so God sent his angels to collect Mary. She's in a realm we don't know anything about except what God reveals to us. And so when we read the Psalms, we're reading about Moses who lived to be 120 years. And we think about, wow, how did he die? Well, he didn't really die in the sense we know of people to die. He went up on the mountain with God and, and he was gone to be with the Lord. Wow, that's, that's just impressive to me. Right. And how did, how did they know that was Elijah and Moses? I, I make the joke. Did they have little name tags on says, hello, my name is Elijah? <laughs> I don't think so. But somehow those guys knew that was, that's Moses and Elijah. And when you read the text, I just I love the way God just gives us to it simply gives it to us simply. He says, Jesus was talking with Moses and Elijah. How profound do you think that conversation was? And yet there's no word of it. It just says, that's all it said. Jesus was talking with Moses and Elijah. They were they were talking. And then Jesus comes back, as Billy's observed, and Moses and Elijah are gone. So they're they're still around. They're still alive. And Jesus would make that point later. That the dead are not really dead because when God met Moses on Mount Sinai at the burning bush, remember what Jesus reminded us that, that God told Moses there? God told Moses, while Moses was alive and in the flesh, God said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Where were Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? God did not say, I was. I used to be the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob until they died. He said, no, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they've been long dead, but he's still their God because they still exist. That's, that's the realm outside of the realm we're in that we have no knowledge of except by faith. And when Moses writes this in the 90th Psalm, He's giving us some idea so we're not floundering around looking for how long should I live? Well, 70 years is about average. That, to me, is what this is saying. And if you're strong enough, you might make it to 80. Well, I might not make it to 62. <laughs> but by the same token as God gives us this information, he always lets us know your salvation is secure in my son. Whether you make it to 62 or to 20. It doesn't really matter because at some point you're going to walk from this existence into the next and you'll be with me. And if you're with my son, you'll be ready. And that's really all that matters. It's not about age and how long. It's about who we're with. Was there a question or observation or a comment that I missed? Somebody get a hand up. I didn't. Okay. Why does it fascinate us to read this in verse 10 of Psalm 90? Because it does. 
Go to Acts. Acts is a place where Paul was talking about the poets of the day and relating what they were saying to life. Acts chapter 17, I'm sorry, I didn't tell you that, did I? Acts 17, verse 26. He, he's mentioned to them in the previous verses about this monument they had to the unknown God because they had all these monuments to the gods they believe existed and then they had this one to the unknown God because they didn't want to leave one out. He's been making mention of that to them and he says in verse 26, He, God, made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times. And then what does he say? The boundaries of their habitation. What does that mean? The boundaries of their habitation. Is that the county line? Do what? I, I don't think so. Boundaries of their habitation? Limits of life? How long they live? What else? How long can you go without air? We, there are boundaries to our habitation. We've got to stay where there's air. We've, what temperature ranges can you withstand without proper clothing? And when you think about it, isn't it just something to marvel at that this planet has such a stable environment? What we know about every other planet in our solar system the, when the sun's not on you, it's minus five zillion degrees. And when the sun is on you, it's plus five zillion degrees. That's the way it is on the other planets because that's just the way they are. The ones that are even stable enough for there to be somebody to set foot on. But us, we range. What do you have your thermostat set on at home? And how many degrees do you allow that to fluctuate? Do you ever go down the hall to your thermostat at night and bump at one degree? <laughs> we do that. And it's like, okay, if it's on 70, we don't need the ceiling fan. No, wait a minute. I get to, if it's on 70, we need to turn on the ceiling fan. But if we bump it down to 69, we don't need the fan. <laughs> one stinking Fahrenheit degree. And so when we read about this and we think God has established the bounds of our habitation, that, that's the kind of thing that comes to mind to me. We are so limited, and yet God has made provisions for us, even with our limitations. And if he's, if he's done this for us and given us the ability, because before air conditioning and central heating, people just had to make clothes or make shade one or the other. Before this, God gave them the ability to do those kinds of things so that humanity could survive in, in some degree of comfort. And here we are, living in the physical, worshiping the spiritual. And God has appointed, has appointed our times, the boundaries of our habitation. Incidentally, just so you can make application if you ever want, in verse 26 when it says, you made from one man every nation of mankind that live on all the face of the earth, what does that do away with automatically? does away with racism. Every individual you see was, came from one man, came from Adam. Like one guy said, he called somebody brother, and, and another guy said, wait a minute, you can't call him brother. He may not be a member of the church. And he said, well, if I don't catch him in Christ, I'll catch him in Adam. We are all brothers in Adam, even if we're not brothers in Christ, because we all came from the same guy, made from one man. So when you look at somebody else in the world and they appear different than you on the outside, it doesn't mean anything except that they just look different from you on the outside. How many races are there anyway? There's really only one. There's the human race. So just a little food for thought there. All right, back to Psalm 90. Verses 11 and 12. Who understands the power of your anger and your fury according to the fear 
that is due you. So teach us to number our days that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. Do you think Moses understood God's anger? What had he seen that would have revealed God's anger to him? How many plagues? How horrible do you think those plagues were? When I get out on the back porch and we're, we're trying to have a little picnic meal out on the back porch and there's one fly, it's like, ah, one stinking fly. And as soon as you think you got rid of him, you go back to doing it and there he is again. And if he's not on you, he's on your food. One fly. What do you think that plague of gnats was like? Just clouds of gnats. Frogs. We were having a little birthday party for Brooks. Uh, turned one yesterday. You know, you get the little cake with the icing and you set them down. And you let them go after it. And he was so tentative. It's like, I don't want to make a mess. <laughs> anyway, well, while we were doing that, I noticed off in the corner there was a little baby turtle, a little box turtle over there. Man, the, it was like all the focus now goes on that little turtle. <laughs> One little turtle. What if your land was covered with frogs? Where uh, I'd forgotten about this until just now. When I was uh, nine years old, I played one year Little League Baseball. I, I was so good they wouldn't let me play anymore after that. <laughs> so I just made all the other boys look bad. But where we played was right next to a river, and in summertime when we played baseball, there were a lot of uh, fertile frogs, I guess, because we just had these little, tiny, cute little frogs all over the place. And they weren't really bothersome, except that you, you'd just be walking along, oh, I just stepped on another one. And, you, and everywhere you went, you just had to do this, because you know there's frogs everywhere, little bitty frogs. Can you imagine what a bunch of live frogs would be? And you're living in a place where you don't have screens on your windows or your doors. Everything is open. And if God puts frogs in your land to curse you, guess where he might get those frogs to go? <laughs> and have you, have you ever thought about that? What it would be like if God just decided to tell all the insects in the world to go after us? Wow. I mean, it's pretty nice that even though there's a lot of spiders and things out there, they, don't, they try to get away from us. What do we also call a fiddleback? A brown recluse. Aren't you thankful that God made them reclusive? What if they were, were named the brown attackers? <laughs> so when, when Moses talks about the anger and the fury of God, he's, he's coming at us from things he understands. According to verse 12, what's he tell us to do based on that anger? And how does that fit? Okay. Why number our days? Why would you ever count your money? What's that? Exactly. This is how much I've got, so now I know what I can do with it. Because you want to use your money how? You want to use it wisely. So numbering our days. Same message. Use your days wisely. If you know the anger of God, it, I remember when I, when I was a I keep thinking about things. You guys are bringing up stuff from my youth today. First and second grade, Mrs. Woofter's class. She leaves the room. Things get out of hand. Some of the kids are telling the other kids, Miss Woofter's going to come back in here and paddle your behind because that's what she did. She didn't ask questions. She said, you, out in the hall. <laughs> and, and the rest of us would sit there in the classroom with the door closed, and we'd hear, wop, 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 wah. That's back in the day when you could do that stuff. And so you didn't have to be afraid of your classmates because all you had to say was, Miss Woofter. And your classmate wouldn't lay a hand on you because, well, they, Miss Woofter would get them. So when Moses says, I understand the anger of God, so number your days. Take account for your life because you know that you're going to be called into account for your life. 
Somebody read uh, 13 through 17. Let's finish out Psalm 90. Who's got that? 13 through 17. Who like? Oh, PJ. PJ. What question does he ask in verse 13? How long? How long will what be? Okay, what circumstance might he be talking about? Anger the Lord. From, from what? How so? What context? Why were they in the wilderness for 40 years? Yeah. So it, it makes perfect sense that Moses would write this. Well, we better number our days because we understand the Lord's anger. And how long will you be angry, Lord? 40 years? We're looking back on it and we understand it was 40 years because it's history. It's all said and done. It wasn't said and done for them. How long? Now today, what, what kind of application might we make to this? Or is there an application to make? It's just, just so old that it doesn't apply anymore. Yes, good point, because that, that's the way it works. Back to Mrs. Woofter. If you got six licks out in the hallway, what did you know about Miss Woofter after the third lick? If you had the maturity to understand it, you'd know after the third lick, Mrs. Woofter cares about how I behave. That's why we're in the hallway and I'm getting licked. Not me, other kids. <laughs> so... So if you had the maturity to understand it, that's what you would understand. But, but we don't always have the maturity to see that there is power in the experience, whatever we're going through. If we're in pain, if we're, if we're celebrating something wonderful, whatever it is, there's power in that experience for us to learn about God. And this is what Moses is laying down for us here, I think. Johnny, did you have a hand up? Right. How long? Anybody here waiting for your ship to come in? <laughs> now, now, why was there a unified giggle over that? Because we, we think like that, don't we? Okay, not today. Who was the, Some comedian said uh, they get up every morning and first they read the, the business page to read the list of the new millionaires and then they read the obituaries and if they're not listed in either one of those categories they just get up and go to work <laughs> so if you're not a new millionaire and you're not dead go on to work because because that's your life and I thought that was funny because that just kind of that, that's us we we go on from day to day living our lives with this idea in mind I'm gonna one of these days I'm gonna make it how many of you, I was just talking with somebody about this yesterday. You get married and, and you're moving along as a brand new husband and wife trying to figure out how to be a husband and wife. And then there's a child. And now you're parents. 
and your child starts school, and maybe while they're in school, or even before that, you have another child, and, and so you, you have this process of thinking, okay, things will slow down a little bit when they get to this grade or to this age, or when they get in high school and become a little more mature. Things will slow down when they go to college. You know, things will slow down when they get off and get out of the house and get married, and things will slow down. Things haven't ever slowed down for us. Is it like that for everybody else? Because I thought by this time, I'd, I'd be laying back a little bit and taking it easy. And I'm just tired all the time. Because no matter what, there's always one more thing to go to and something else to do. And it's, it's not bad. It's just life. And in the midst of life, you can forget to number your days. You can, you can forget to stop and consider the older I get, the more I see the wisdom in God saying there's going to be a Sabbath every week. And on that day, sit down. Don't do anything. It's not until we're still and quiet that we start to think about God for the most part. The rest of the time, we're just busy. We're just busy. And Moses says, you better number your days. How long will it be, Lord, that you're angry with us? According to verse 14, he's looking for the loving kindness of God so they can sing for joy and be glad. When is the loving kindness of God not visible or not obvious? Even in the middle of trial, for example, 40 years in the wilderness. You're 20 years into this 40 years. Is there any indication that you still have the loving kindness of God? All right. What could he have done? Could have wiped him out. As a matter of fact, that's what he said. Moses the one who didn't want to go in the first place, Moses has become now the, uh, the advocate. Yes, he's become the advocate of Israel. These people that he said, he's no good stinking. Israelites complaining all the time. I just get so sick and tired of them. He didn't say it in those words, but, but he kind of said that. And then he says, no, Lord, don't, don't wipe them out. Because if you wipe them out, then what are people going to say about you? Moses had his mind on right. He was thinking about God and how all this reflect, would reflect on God. And so he stood in Israel's defense so that God would keep them alive. And he did that through the 40 years. And, and while they were in the wilderness, what happened to their clothing? It never wore out. What did they eat? Manna. What did they drink? Water from a rock. They also ate quail. They, they were taken care of for 40 years, even though they were in the 40 years, because they were faithless slobs, complaining all the time. I'm sorry, I don't mean to say bad things about people, but I think that's what the text is revealing to us. And yet the loving kindness of God is what Moses is talking about here, because he sees he's, he's making a future, and any Israelite... Even if you're in, under the condemnation of dying during or at the end of that 40 years, you know you can turn your heart back to the Lord and you'll find salvation. Just because you died in the wilderness doesn't mean your soul was lost eternally. Didn't have to be. Anybody who wants to can turn to the Lord. So Moses is, is juxtaposing uh, I'm not crazy about that word, but it works. The anger of God with the loving kindness of God. And he's, he's talking about this as a relationship that is sometimes antagonized by the behavior of God's children. Observations, comments? Anybody got anything? Yes. Sure.
God's, God's always perfect in everything he does. Wouldn't it be great to reach a point in life where, okay, from this point on, Marty, you're going to do it just right. Well, I'm not there yet. And I know I'm not going to get there. But we're still, we're still moving ahead with who we are. And we move ahead under the umbrella of the grace and loving kindness of God. We were under the pain of death, but no longer. We were under slavery, just like they were in slavery in Egypt. We were in slavery in sin, but now we've been set free. And while we're set free and we're, we're moving on to the promised land, we're not doing it all just exactly right. And sometimes we forget to stop and number our days and consider we're limited. When I was 25 and thought about the day that I would be 60, I would have thought at 25 or 30 or 35, man, when I'm 60, I'm old. Yeah, well, you understand. Now that I'm 60, I don't think of myself as old. No, I call myself an old guy, but... Inside me, I know well, I got another 50, 60 years. Now, the outside is said, no, Marty, no, you don't. <laughs> but, but that's our spirit. We're, we're looking towards the future, and we're anticipating things that are good because that's the way God made us. And, and everything about faith is that. Faith always points us towards the future. No matter what my history is, of things that I'm not proud of, God's not pointing me back to my, and so look at that, Marty, what you did. Look at what you said there. Look at what the way you used to think. Man, he, didn't, he doesn't do that to me. He says, Marty, let's look ahead. Let's look forward. Number your days, not the days in the past. Number the days for you, Marty, that are ahead of you. Consider my anger, yes, but also look for my loving kindness. It's the balance. And we, wanted, we, we, do, we do this with our children. We want our children to know in no uncertain terms that we love them, and we're going to love them no matter what. But if your behavior is not what it ought to be, mommy and daddy have to take things in the hand. So what was it Paul wrote? Behold the goodness and the severity of God. You got, you got both because that's the only way there can be justice is for there to be goodness and severity. All right, that's... A psalm from Moses. How much time do we have left? What? T ten minutes. All right. Let's go to Psalm 5. Let's talk about uh, imprecatory psalms. What does the word imprecatory mean? What does the word imprecate mean? It's not pleasant. There are a number of psalms and parts of psalms. Sometimes it's not the entire psalm, but it's just part of a psalm that can be described as imprecatory. In other words, it's a calling on God to take evil into account, to punish evil. It's an interesting way of thinking as far as the scriptures go and as far as the word of God goes that through inspiration, godly people would call on God to bring punishment on those who do evil. But that's what these psalms do. Uh, let's read the fifth psalm together. Uh, I need two readers, one for 1 through 7 and one for 8 through 12. Who's got 1 through 7? Need a reader for 1 through 7, Psalm 5. All right, Carolyn, and then 8 through 12, who will read that? All right, we're, we're good to go, Shannon.
by. What time of day is David calling on God? In the morning. In the morning, verse 3, you'll hear my voice. In the morning, I'll order my prayer to you and, and eagerly watch. What's he watching for, do you think? Results of the prayer. Based on the first couple of verses, what's provoking David to pray so early in the morning? Verse 1. Give ear to my words, O Lord, consider my groaning. What do some of the other translations have besides groaning? What's that? Meditation. Meditation. All right. Sighing. Yeah. Putting up with a lot. Groaning. Meditating. Thinking about in, in the mind what's going on. In the morning you'll hear my voice. In the morning I'll order my prayer to you and eagerly watch. For you're not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness. That's what is on David's mind. Wickedness. No evil dwells with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. Why do you think David brings that up? The boastful, those who do iniquity, those who speak falsehood, verse 6. The man of bloodshed and deceit, verse 6. Down in verse uh, 8 and following. Lead me in your righteousness because of what? Because of my enemies, because of my foes. What do you think's on David's mind when he makes that statement right there? Lord, lead me in your righteousness because of my foes. What, what's that have to do? What does one have to do with the other? Okay. All right. All right. Very true. When are we most tempted to play fast and loose with what we know is right? When, when you're defending yourself, you think you won't get caught. When, you, when you're in one end of the extreme, when you're just so pressured by the, the pain and difficulty of life, I also think it's the other end of the extreme. When you're so well off that you think, hey, I got it great. I don't think I need the Lord today. You got these two extremes. David's talking about only one of those right now, but he is talking about that one, I think. Make your way straight before me. There's nothing reliable in what they say. This is verse 9. And then look at the rest of verse 9. Their inward part is destruction itself. Their throat is an open grave. Does that sound familiar? Where else do we read that? Do you have a footnote in your margin? Art? Okay. I, I'm thinking of Romans chapter 3. Paul writes to make a point. Now, you might be thinking of Jesus talking about the Pharisees, and, and they are whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones which sounds very close to this. But in chapter 3 of Romans, Paul is writing about the fact that every human being is under sin. And he quotes this passage right here. Their throat is an open grave. They flatter with the tongue. Hold them guilty, O God. By their own devices, let them fall. Is that justice? Right. Does sound like that, doesn't it? Let them enjoy the fruit of their labor. I, I think I scared a young girl to death on uh, Facebook. This has been a few months back. We were having a discussion about, uh, about abortion. And she was arguing vehemently in, in a very ugly way 
in favor of abortion. And I just got to a point where I'm, I wasn't sure what to say to her. And so I, said, I, I wrote to her and I said, here's what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to pray to God for you that he will simply give you the, the fruit of what you are promoting right here. Now, what would be wrong with doing that? If you're promoting something and somebody tells you, hey, based on what you're promoting, I'm going to ask God to give you the fruit of what you're promoting. And she started back, she called me some name after that. You stay away from me, you crazy man. It's like, what, what do you mean crazy man? If you think that's the right thing to do, and I'm just telling you, I'm going to pray to God and, and ask him to bless you with regard to what you're promoting. How is that wrong or offensive? That's what David's doing here. He's asking God to deliver to these guys what they're working for. Are we supposed to love our enemies? We know that we are. Jesus taught us that. What else are we supposed to love according to Jesus? Justice. Justice. He talked about the weightier things of the law. One of those weightier things is justice. And for us, we have to be very careful because there's a, there's a hard line that needs to be observed between love and compassion and justice. That's why I would have a hard time being a judge in our present court system because I'm, I don't want to be wrong on either way. But that's what we're looking at here in the fifth psalm. All right, that's the end of our class. Lord bless you, and uh, let's go from here.